Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we want to first say thank you for joining us today for our 2021 Black History Month program, Finding Freedom in Greene County. My name is Melissa Dalton, and I am the Public Outreach Coordinator for the Greene County Records Center and Archives. Hello, my name is Elise Kelly, and I am the Multimedia Archivist for the Greene County Records Center and Archives. So before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we will be recording this through this program today. So we do ask that you please remain muted and keep your um, video disabled throughout the program. Um, if you have any problems hearing us or having kind of technical issues, if you want to let us know, please use the chat feature and we'll do what we can to assist you. Additionally, we will have time at the end for question and answers. Um, so to get started here at the archives, um, we wanted to do something special this year. And so today we are presenting an incredible story of determination, love, sacrifice, and historical change. We came upon this story uh, through our deed records, but we also read a brief history, family history account in Hallie Q. Brown's book entitled Pen Pictures of Pioneers of Wilberforce. So since Hallie Q. Brown actually did provide us some insight into the story, I wanted to give you a little bit of her background. So Hallie Q. Brown was the daughter of two former slaves, uh, Francis Jane Scroggins and Thomas Arthur Brown. Her father was able to purchase his freedom, but her mother was actually provided her freedom from her grandfather, who was um, a white slave owner. While Hallie Q. Brown, uh, Hallie Q. Brown graduated from Wilberforce University in 1873 and then began a career teaching all over the United States. Um, she actually began on a South Carolina plantation. Her reputation as being an excellent educator significantly grew. She was the Dean of Allen University in South Carolina, the principal of Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, and a professor at Wilberforce University. Brown was a magnificent elocutionist. She, who frequently lectured um, on the equal rights of African-Americans, and she advocated for the temperance movement. In 1937, she chronicled the lives of Wilberforce's pioneers in her book, Pen Pictures of Pioneers of Wilberforce. At the age of 100, Hallie Coop Brown passed away on September 16, 1949 in Wilberforce, Ohio. Now today's program actually focuses on one family and they were the Pipers. This family actually included Philip Piper, Nellie Piper and their children. And this family was originally from Catahoula Parish in Louisiana, which is indicated in red on the screen here. Now, just a little interesting fact. Uh, if you notice here that you, Louisiana, Louisiana uh, uses the word parish instead of county. Um, if you're not familiar, the reason for this is parish is an ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical term. And it means um, it's a meaning for an administrative district that was originally part of the Roman Catholic Church, and it was centered around one church, and it was administrated by the priest. And Louisiana was officially Roman Catholic under both French and Spain's rule, and the boundaries dividing those territories generally coincided with the church parishes. And then in 1807, the territorial legislature officially adopted this term parish. So throughout the change in her history, Louisiana never deviated from the use and the primary civil divisions have been officially known as parishes ever since. So today it is the equivalent of a county and this term is um, particular to Louisiana. So as stated, this is a bit of an unusual story. So let's start with Philip. Um, so during the 1950s, or eight, I'm sorry, 1850s and 1860s, slave schedules were compiled along with census records. And a slave schedule was a method to account for the number of slaves and a slave owner had during the time of the census. 
And most of these do not list names, but they do list age, sex, and color race. Um, typically, those were usually the things that were typically notated. Um, now, according to the 1860 Catahoula Parish, Louisiana um, slave schedule, Phyllis, Philip Piper owned several slaves. So we have an um, up here on the screen, and I actually meant to include, and I'll do that now in the chat. Um, we have, let's see if this actually works for you, um, a link to the actual documents that we are using today. So if you, oh, that link may not work. Let me try. Um, if it doesn't work, let me know. Um, that way you can actually see the records up close. Um, but you can at least see them on the screen, hopefully um, good enough here. So this is the slave schedule uh, for Catahoula Parish in 1816. Um, Philip Piper's listed, um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor right here. And here it shows that under his name, there are 16 tick marks and it indicates age, sex, and race. So this represents the slaves that Philip owned and there are 16 slaves identified. There are eight male and eight female. The youngest being a two month old male and the oldest being a 52 year old female. Sorry about that. So now let's look at the census record. On this, it shows Philip Piper and we have it outlined here in red. Um, hopefully you can read it. It's not as good of a copy, but Philip Piper's listed here in 1860 as a 50 year old male. He's a white planter and his real estate value is at $16,000 in 1860. And his personal estate was worth $20,000. Can I add to that? I'm not sure. So I'm sorry, I meant to actually look up the equivalent of that today, but it's it's probably close to uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars today. So that gives you an idea of Philip. So the interesting thing is though, so that was the 1860 census, but a year prior in, in 1859, he emancipated several slaves here in Greene County. So here we show you um, a, just a clip or it's just an excerpt of the emancipation record. Um, and this was, this was recorded in Greene County as part of our deed records. So some of you may be wondering why emancipation records were recorded in deed records. Um, they could actually be recorded in a variety of records, but in specific, specifically here, they use the deed records because a deed is a legal instrument um, in writing and it passes, um, affirms or confirms an interest, right, or property um, that's either signed, it's signed, attested, delivered, and sealed. So as such, since slaves were considered his property, um, that's the reason they decided to utilize deed records as they were considered property. So this shows... Um, so they would have to, um, sorry about that. <laughs> so the slaves of Philip Piper were his property, which is why their freedom papers were in the deed book. Now we've also provided a transcript of the deed record as part of that link. So if you wanna go out and actually read it, I know it's kind of hard to read here on the screen. Um, it, it may be useful to take a look at that. So in this document, it states that Philip Piper is freeing Nellie and her children and that they are settling in Greene County, Ohio, and they are paying $1,000 for their freedom. And you'll also notice here, if you're able to read any of it, it goes through and it actually names each individual that is being freed by Philip Piper. Um, so we have one here, I can just read a section of it here. It says, um, so one of them is um, Silas Fi Piper, age about two years, and son of said Nellie Piper, um, and it says that, let's see, yeah, um, is the color of a mulatto and said Amanda, um, uh, Adela, Alexander and Silas all being of, good of good size and for their ages and in good health. So 
it just kind of gives you, this one doesn't give you quite as much as some of the others that we have, but it kind of gives you a, a, a short description of each individual in here. And you'll also probably notice that um, they use a term mulatto, which today is, it's not a term we use today. It is actually considered, can be considered offensive, but it, it was actually a term used to signify mixed ancestry, particularly a person of white and black ancestry. So it's not a, it's usually just one that's used in historical context. Um, but something that we want to note right now is that these children are actually Philip Piper's children. And Nellie and Philip Piper actually did have a relationship. And he came to Greene County specifically to free them. And he actually did plan to stay. Um, and Elise will talk more about that in a little bit. But these papers were important because not only did you have to record this as part of law, which we'll talk about in a moment, but these record these acted as a way to identify who you were. Um, so if you were stopped on the street or something, you had these freedom papers, and it was vitally important that they carried them with them at all times. Um, it because if not, a slave owner or a slave catcher could claim that the freed African American wasn't who they claimed to be and be taken back into bondage. Um, sadly, even there were inst instances where those who were legally free were still captured and take, sold back into slavery. So these documents were very important. So at this time, there were a lot of laws um, throughout the country called the Black Laws or Black Codes. And they were enacted to reduce the influence of freed African-Americans on the slave population. These laws were passed in the Southern states mostly um, to begin with, but many Northern states um, enact, enacted very similar laws, um, which did not allow the, the freed peoples to the right to vote, um, right to own guns, assemble, testify in court, um, in some cases, even learn how to read or write. And these laws were a way for the slave owners and white society as a whole to protect or preserve their way of life. So even though Ohio's constitution made slavery illegal, that did not mean that freed persons were treated as equals. In 1804, Ohio passed a series of laws called the Black Laws. And these required that um, all persons, um, African-Americans to furnish certificates of freedom from a court in the United States before they could even settle in Ohio. So that meant that all african Americans African-American residents, even if they were already residing within the state or even born free, had to register with the names of all their family members, including children, and had to pay a fee usually per person. Additionally, it was punishable offense to employ a Black person who could not present a certificate of freedom. And then in 1807, these laws were made even stricter. Now, you had to find at least two people who would guarantee a surety of $500 for each African-American's good behavior. So if you had a family like the Pipers who had a family of seven, eight people, you're looking at a large sum of money that you had to um, put forth or find somebody willing to actually put forth for you. And again, they were still limited on their abilities and rights. So they couldn't marry a white person. Again, they still couldn't um, own guns. They couldn't enroll in the militia, militia, they couldn't serve on juries, and like we said, attend public, even attend public schools. So after giving you a little bit of information about Ohio, although it was a free state, obviously we did, they didn't really make it all that easy um, and, and weren't always that welcoming. So why did they come to Ohio in particular and Greene County? So Greene County um, was actually had a reputation as a place with a strong and large abolitionist community. Um, and they also had very cheap, fertile farmland. So freed African-Americans were welcomed by these communities and many were able to own their own land. And the Piper family, actually settled here in Greene County and around Wilberforce University, as did many other former slave families for this very reason. 
So here we have um, a map of the Piper family. This is actually after um, Philip Piper passed away. This, this is a, a survey for his heirs. So you'll see that Philip Piper, um, we have Philip Piper here, and then um, children down here. So Alexander and thank you, Silas and Josephine, Delia. And you can also see these are some, um, inter or not interesting, but well-known names. Um, Bishop Arnett is here and his family too. Okay, so another reason that they would want to settle here in Greene County was because of the opportunities offered by Wilberforce University. As you can see in the picture on the left, an early picture of Wilberforce University's campus. And then on the right is a picture from an 1855 map of, uh, I'm sorry, 1874 map of uh, Wilberforce College at the time um, here in Greene County. And you can see how close the Pipers are to Wilberforce. So Wilberforce was established as an institution for the free for freed blacks, including the slave children of Southern plantation owners to gain higher education. Uh, they were able to attend university, something not very common for at this time, especially. Um, in, er in early 1856, the Methodist Episcopal Church purchased property for the new institution at Tawawa Springs near Xenia, Ohio. And Wilberforce University in Xenia, um, it's interesting to note, during the year of 1862, when the Civil War was raging, um, they had to close. But to give you a little background of how Wilberforce had started and or how it expanded, in March of 1863, Bishop Daniel A. Payne of the African, African Methodist Episcopal Church negotiated to purchase the university's facilities. Payne, a member of the original 1856 corporation, secured the co cooperation of John G. Mitchell, the principal of the Eastern District Public School of Z Cincinnati, Ohio, and James A. Shorter, pastor of the AME Church of Zanesville, Ohio. So by combining with them, the property was soon turned over to them as agents of the church and was incorporated on July 10th, 1863. And in 1887, the state of Ohio began to fund the university by establishing a combined normal and industrial department. This department later became Central State University, which is right next to Wilberforce right today. Wilberforce also spawned another institution, which is Payne Theological Seminary, which is also very right on the campus. It was founded in 1891 as an outgrowth of the theological department at Wilberforce University. So this is just another reason of why uh, many former slaves settled here in Greene County. So it's interesting to note that um, the pictures above are of Reverend Daniel Payne, and he was one of the founders, as we said, of Wilberforce University. But he had a stipulation. He told Philip and Nellie that if they wanted to remain in the community, they had to marry. Well, they had a problem there because after a year after settling, Philip and Nellie got married in 1861. However, as we remember, Philip is a white slave owner and Nellie is a former slave, um, an African-American woman. And as we remember, as Melissa said about the Ohio Black Codes, they were not a biracial couple were not allowed to marry in Ohio. So they actually had to go all the way to Pennsylvania to get married. And then they, they traveled to Pennsylvania and then they were legally married. They were, it was a legal marriage that they could be recognized in the state of Ohio. But I think it's pretty very unusual that a slave um, master would pretty much leave his um, property down in Louisiana, take his family up here to Greene County and marry his a slave, his former slave, and stay here and settle here in Greene County with her and her and their children. So here we have um, a register of death. Now, 
For 18 years, Philip and Nellie lived as husband and wife in Greene County. Sadly, in 1879, Philip died. And here is one of our Register of Deaths book that has Philip listed. And Melissa is going to point out exactly where Philip is on the Register of Deaths. You can see here he's number 87. He died November 1st, 1879. Place of death is Xenia Township. He was 74 years old. And if any of you can look at the column where it says color, you can see that they had put him down as colored, which I think is very interesting. So remember, Philip was a white slave owner. This is so ironic since his children, previously his slaves, are, in, are inheriting his estate. And yet he, and yet this former slave owner is being recognized as being colored which I really don't think he would have a problem with since he, he was so ahead of the times by um, marrying his uh, former slave. This is another page from the death record that continues. And you can see that Philip, it's, uh, there's a star at the left that you can see that um, that's Philip's entry. You can see he was married, he was a farmer and he died of heart disease. But let's look at some of the other um, diseases that people had, you know, what they would have died from back in 1879. You can see here cholera, which is a bacterial infection of intestines caused by contaminated water. Just old age. Uh, dropsy, which is edema. Consumption, which is tuberculosis. Rheumatism you know, the, the disease of your joints and muscles. You'll see congestion of the lungs. This is where the blood vessels and blood vessels and the air sacs fill with blood due to a number of factors. Kidney disease, and look at here, which I find very interesting, a broken leg. Now, I don't think a lot of people would die today of a broken leg, but back then it could have been infected. Um, he could have not taken care of it, so. I found that interesting. Okay, next we have, we kind of created a uh, family tree of the Piper family. Here we have the matriarch and the patriarch, Philip Piper on the right and Nellie on the left. Now here we're showing that they have seven children, but according to Nellie's, um, Obituary, she, they actually had nine children. We believe that two of her children died at a very young age. But I, I think it's wonderful to see that, you can see that um, their children and then their grandchildren, they had 17 grandchildren at the time, around 1880. So this is just a remarkable that these heirs are carrying on this legacy um, here in Greene County. And then we found um, by looking at one of the, examining one of uh, Nellie and Phillips' sons, their firstborn son, we found in the 1880 census record in Greene County that we were able to gather some information about Silas Piper, which is the firstborn son after the Civil War. What was what happened to their lives after the Civil War? And you can see that they really had advanced employment opportunities at this time. Um, and so, uh, in red, in the red rectangle, you'll see that um, it says Cyrus, but it really is supposed to be spelled Silas Piper. He's a grocer at the time, and that you can see he's born from Louisiana. Now, this is pretty remarkable, considering he was a former slave, and now he's listed as a grocer, which perhaps means that he owned his own grocery store in Xenia. And his wife, Ella, below, she is listed as being born in North Carolina, which probably she might have been a slave at that time since that was a, a, a state that um, recognized slavery, was a school teacher, which she most likely taught only African-American children. This is impressive and pretty awesome for two former slaves as many rights and liberties were restricted towards them at their, at, when they were slaves at the time. But now that they are free people, they have this opportunity to really advance themselves. 
Additionally, they both were in their early 20s at this time. So they have an opportunity to teach children and Silas had an opportunity to own something for himself. And Silas also is important to note was a graduate from Wilberforce University. So Nellie lived a very long life and experienced much. Um, she died at the age of 100. And I'd like to read you her obituary real quick. Mrs. Nellie Piper, this was a, a obituary found in the Xenia Daily Gazette. Mrs. Nellie Piper, widow of Philip Piper, died at the age of 100 years, Thursday night at 9.30 at the home of her daughter, Mrs. Baldwin Allen, on South Columbus Street in Xenia. Mrs. Piper was indeed a remarkable woman. She came to Wilberforce from the South in the early 1860s and spent her remaining days there until four years ago when she came to this city, Xenia, and made her home with her daughter. Despite her great age, until within a few weeks of her death, she retained all her faculties and could converse with her friends and old acquaintances as fluently as one of less than half her age. She took an active interest in the affairs of everyday life, was a good talker, and it was a great pleasure to come in contact with her. Mrs. Piper was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in the year 1816. The exact month is unknown. Mrs. Piper was the mother of nine children, four of whom are living. And, she, and, a, and a grandmother, and she had very several great-grandchildren. She professed the hope in Christ in early life, lived a conscientious Christian life through all the intervening years, and was a faithful member of the Middle Run Baptist Church. So I think it's kind of interesting that they don't mention that she was a former slave, but they do mention how she was such a remarkable person, a good talker, and had an active interest in everyday life, even at the age of 100. This woman had seen a lot throughout her years. And here we have two, pic two pictures, but the same um, grave marker. You can see Nellie on the left, and then Philip Piper, her husband on the right. So Philip Piper, it's the same grave marker, but and they share the same grave marker. And this is uh, at Massey's Creek Cemetery in Cedarville, Ohio. So it's just a wonderful story and such a remarkable story that two, that a former slave and a slave owner came together to create um, Un, to create so many different things in the, so. So uh, we wanna thank you for joining us today for our program, Finding Freedom in Green County. Um, here is just a little bit of information for you about the archives. Um, my information and Elise's inf contact information uh, is up here for you. Um, as well as our website, um, our blog posts. We do a bunch of, or we do uh, weekly blog posts and we actually have a lot out there right now um, for all kinds of, um, I'm trying to think of what, what we've been doing recently. Uh, it's kind of been kind of a hodgepodge recently <laughs> on our blog, um, but we, uh, last year we did a series for, for um, a, a group of people who were, um, bought, who were actually freed, they were bought by one person and then freed in Greene County. Um, he actually bought a bunch of former slaves that were all related and then brought them to Greene County and freed them. So we have several blog posts out there um, regarding those families. Um, so if you're looking for maybe a little more information about um, people who settled or former slaves and African-Americans who settled here in Greene County um, during, you know, during that time, we have that out there. Um, if you aren't want to do this much, we also, we're on our Facebook page daily. We have daily posts. We post to Twitter um, and Instagram. If you are interested in seeing more of these documents, the emancipation records, they are on our Flickr page, which you can search Green County Archives on Flickr and um, you can access those. Uh, they are all digitized and they're all up there. And we also have transcripts on our website as well. So if you follow that web link, you can get transcripts to them as well. 
And we also, um, this will be, this is recorded and it will be up on our YouTube page as well. So if you know anybody who might be interested, please feel free to direct them to our YouTube page. Um, so if you have any questions, we would like to open it up. So please use the chat feature if you have any questions and we will do our best to answer them. Thank you, Amber. Glad you enjoyed it. Sherry, I saw your question. Um, so you asked, you mentioned that Hallie Q. Brown wrote about them in her book. What did she have to say about their union and the life together? It was, it, yeah, she was the one who, um, gave us the information. It wasn't a very long, uh, it wasn't a very long entry about it, but she was the, she's the, where we got the information about them going to, um, going to Pennsylvania to get married. Um, and it was, it was very brief, but that's kind of what got us interested because we weren't even aware that they were married. Um, because obviously we don't have a, a record of their marriage here, considering it was illegal at that time to get married. So that's how we found out about it. it. It's not a very long entry, but that's that's what got us interested in this story. I hope I answered that question. Um, Betsy, uh, are there any surviving papers from the Piper family or is it just the public records available? As far as I know, it's just public records, but if there are still some people out there, then I am sure that they, they may have some papers, but we are not aware of them at this time. Okay, all right, Nancy. Hello to you too. Yes, hello. <laughs> I'm glad that you learned a lot. Um, Okay, so you ask, I'll be telling my Ohio history class about this. Great, please, please do. We'll have it recorded and up on our website very soon. And yes, we did see that Jared was on as well. <laughs> I'm interested in the Mitchell family. Um, we would have to look up. I can take a look when we get back to the office to see if we have them in the index for these records. Um, so I can, if we do, I can send you an email. Um, I'm sure I can get your email on, I, I may actually have it or Robin might have it. So I'll take a look and check out the Mitchell family. Thank you, Betsy. Oh. Um, Sherry, that's a good question. Um, I would actually have to go back. Um, Sherry asks if if she used any words or terms that provided perhaps her opinion about the relationship. Because um, she said that she, um, first, because I know we were often cautioned about considering relationships between enslavers and enslaved people because enslaved people could not give consent, correct. Um, so I, um, I'm not sure, I'll have to go back and look at the, the entry, um, but it, it did sound like they were one of those couples who actually did eventually. Yeah. Considering that he, he left his entire property in Louisiana and, you know, forego his life as a slave owner and, and move to Greene County, I think, you know, that kind of shows, I would think it shows that he really cared for her. But I will look that up and let you know. Um, it, and I can, if I can find, or I can take a look and even send you the passage if you'd like, Sherry.
Yes, yeah, thank you, Linda. That yeah, if you haven't had a chance to um, see pen pictures of pioneers of Wilberforce, um, it may be possible that oh, if someone asked that it's the pen pictures of pioneers of Wilberforce by Hallie Q. Brown. Um, you may be able to find it online. Um, I feel like I've seen some at least bits and pieces of it digitized online. Um, but if not, um, I'll have to look to see if there if it's available. Yes, thank you, Sherry. Any further questions before we uh, sign off? Um, so we were just asked if uh, the archives are open for use. So we are by appointment only right now. And we don't actually expect that to change anytime soon. So our current policy is um, we are open Monday through Friday, 930 to 4, I'm sorry, 9 to 430. And um, we can only allow one, uh, one patron at a time. And you do have to schedule an appointment. You can't just walk in. So if you are interested in doing research, um, we also really recommend checking out our website first because we have digitized a lot of records over the past year and put a lot up on, um, on either Instagram, or we have stuff up on Flickr. Um, we also have recently gotten a lot more, or actually there's a lot more that's now available on FamilySearch. So if you're not familiar with FamilySearch, um, give us a call and we can at least tell you we have actually we have a lot of resources on our website on how to locate different types of records um, that are on family search. So it, it may be beneficial to check that out, depending on what kind of research you're looking to do. Um, we, you may have luck finding a lot of it online and family search is actually free so you can easily um, create an account and utilize their services. Any other questions? I'd just like to say thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for attending and hearing us. <laughs> oh, sure. And, and I will be, um, well, I, I had already mentioned this to my class and there may be more people here I just didn't recognize uh, from my class, but they do need to do a document, uh, a, a document analysis. So I will tell okay. them that they could contact you, use your website, or perhaps even uh, make an appointment. Oh, yes, that'd be just fine. Great. All right, well, thank you. Good to, good to talk with y'all or. Yes. <laughs> thank you. This is fun. Thank you. Yeah. Any last questions? If not, we'll go ahead and uh, sign off. Okay, well, if there's no further questions, we wanna say once again, thank you for joining us today. Um, we hope you enjoyed the program. And if you have any questions, please feel re free to reach out. And we hope you have a great day, thanks. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.